All right, so fast go through, let's see if I have this over here, left hand in my hand. Um, and, and so this is from a book that you don't have. This is the previous book. Um, and uh, there's a few differences, but it's, it's not a big concern. Okay, so uh, anatomy, um, anterior, the first and second lumbar bodies, we don't, I wouldn't need to know that uh, necessarily since we're not counting lumbar bodies. That's, that, uh, that means the, the uh, um, spinal cord, the lumbar, uh, the, the lumbar uh, spine. Um, deep in the epigastrium and left hypochondrium behind the lesser omental sac. I put that in blue for a reason. It's behind the lesser sac. Major uh, posterior uh, va vascular landmarks are the aorta and inferior vena cava. And I, I don't know, I happen to think that the uh, major posterior vascular landmark is also the uh, uh, splenic vein, which travels along the posterior surface. So I would say aorta, IVC, and splenic vein. And I really, really I like this picture because it shows why we see, we only see the head sometimes. Like I said, this is a really difficult organ for us to get to because it sits behind the stomach. It sits somewhat, uh, depending on our exact anatomy, it could be sitting behind the transverse colon. And a lot of times what I'll do um, is I'll get right about here. Um, Oh, I'm looking over here. Make sure I dropped it. Okay. I'll put my transducer right here. This is the epigastrium, and, and uh, uh, I'll look at the gas patterns first in sagittal to try to figure out what's going on. And once I figure that out, then I'll go transverse and try to get this guy. But um, here's a little bit of the head sticking out and the rest, the rest of the body and tail is, is totally behind these gas producing uh, organs. So not an easy thing to look at, but we'll, we'll work on all sorts of ways of doing that. A little bit easier when you got a nice liver sitting on top of, of the pancreas, but it's not always there. Um, and this person's stomach is probably at a slightly different level, probably slightly superior uh, so you know, we're not seeing it here, but uh, you know, we're seeing the aorta, and SMA, and the splenic vein along there. Splenic vein. I'm a little bit uh, uh, confused. I, I'm not 100% sure what I'm looking at. This could be the, the splenic artery which is at a slightly higher, more superior level than this image, is very tortuous. It, it can do all sorts of crazy things, especially as it's farther down. So that this might be a bend, and we're seeing a little bit of splenic artery right there. But other than that, I don't, don't have no other explanation for that. Horizontal oblique lie, we already mentioned that yesterday from the second portion of duodenum, the S loop of the I'm sorry, the C loop of the duodenum. What, what happened there? Um, all the way back to the splenic hilum. Uh, normal pancreas right here. We see it kind of a little flattened out. This is the uncinate process right here. Look at that. You can actually see the tissue difference here as opposed to the rest of the head. That's the process. That, that little bit of tissue difference. Um, Interestingly enough, it uh, shows a slightly different echogenicity. But uh, head, neck, body, and tail running down this way. Oh, that's right, I forgot about this one. SMA. Left renal vein. Okay. I had to change something on this. Oh, I don't know. I'll talk about that later. I had to change something. Um, uh, my other book. Uh, so let me tell you why. I don't know if I ever told you why we we switched books. 
and, and we saw my other, actually both of my other um, PDs when I was a PD in Houston and in um, Tucson, no, I'm sorry, uh, um, Phoenix, were, um, were not really happy switching books. They were used to that other book, but uh, you know, I literally couldn't go two pages without finding something wrong. And I'm not talking about just typos, I'm talking about wrong. Um, I had changed this from head to tail. And I think you guys, you guys might, rem uh, you might rem remember um, that I kind of had to pause when I was talking about this at one point because I'm like, wait a minute, is it head or tail, head or tail? Well, no wonder I was a little confused. I had a book, a book that I had actually when I was in school that said the head uh, uh, had a slightly intraperitoneal section to it. No, it's not the head. It is the tail. And so the book was, my, the old book was wrong. I had to double check that too. Um, let's see, organs are much better than occupies. Uh, posterior to pancreas, so the portosplenic confluence, superior mesenteric vessels, aorta, and inferior vena cava. And so, yeah, here's your inferior vena cava. Aorta is coming all the way up. For some reason, cut out here. The mesenteric arteries, the SMA is behind here, and the, the uh, um, celiac axis and the hepatic and splenic arteries they're posterior and superior. So in other words, they're on the top edge here, but also behind. So they're posterior and superior. Um, stomach to and transfer colon. Yeah, okay. So here's that C loop of the duodenum with the head nestled right in there, all comfy and cozy. And the tail going all the way back to the spleen. Here's that SMV. SMV is coming in goes anterior to the uncinate process, posterior to the neck, and then right about, oh, let's just say right about here is where, is where the confluence is. So we have, we have that, the other, the other vein coming in this way, reach there, and then they go up uh, whoop, to the liver. So that's the main portal vein, splenic vein, superior mesenteric vein all coming together right here. Oh no. Um, that's interesting. What am I using to uh, draw? It's not how it happened. Let's see, undo. All right, well, I guess we have a red circle. No, why aren't the red lines in black? Mm -hmm. And what's frustrating, uh, Something, all right, well, well, that's going to drive me crazy. Okay, ahead of the pancreas, uh, that's within cross the anterior posterior. Well, there's a small curved tip, we know that. Neck, so our book doesn't even really mention the neck, so but it's anterior to the portal splenic confluence, which is right about there. Body of the pancreas, the largest section, anterior to the aorta and celiac axis. So it's ant this is anterior surface up here, anterior uh, um, surface of the pancreas, and then um, the entire pancreas is anterior to the splenic vein, SMA, aorta, renal vein. Okay. Uh, the duct of Weir Sung, 
comes, whoops, sorry, comes through, meets as the ampulla of Vader. The muscles around there should be the sphincter of Bodhi, although, yeah, they kind of have it there. The sphincter of Bodhi, this is the muscles around the outside there, common bile ducts coming in. Um, the accessory duct is the duct of Santorini. And pancreas divisum is when there was a failure of embryologic pancreatic buds to fully fuse. And so uh, exterior looks very normal. And in fact, you will not find this on ultrasound. If you do, uh, con congratulations, it'll be the, the first in history, but probably very unlikely to find this in ultrasound. Um, but that's pancreas, pancreas divisum is just simply uh, um, a incorrect uh, division of how the uh, two ducts come together. Uh, we, could, we could ignore this because we're going to go with our new book. Typical measurements, how to measure the pancreas. Another, another normal pancreas. Uh, we looked at this mass yesterday. Another mass. The vascular supply, the gastroduodenal artery. So the gastroduodenal artery has a branch of the pancrea pancreatic uh, pancreatic. Well, actually, the other book says pancreatico duodenal artery. Then the inferior pancreatico duodenal artery comes from the SMA. But you know they're really anastomose. Uh, with each other anyway. Splenic artery, of course, also feeds the pancreas. Yes, this was so hard to read. I... Um, by the way, this person's called uh, common bile duct is way too big. Um, so that is a little bit abnormal. The GDA looks normal. Common bile looks high too. Weird. But, um, and I see just a little bit of fluid right there. Makes me wonder, is that in, is that exterior to the head? That's uh, interesting. Anyway, uh, it's not the fuck down. Can, uh, so agenesis is incompatible with life. You might have an agenesis of the tail, or, or and you know, in which case you'll have high compensatory hypertrophy of the head. What was I going to say? Oh, we already mentioned that one. Uh, the annular pan pancreas, because these buds grow together from different locations, and they actually grow from, from this direction over. And uh, you know, if they don't do full migration, they can cause a constricture of the duodenum. And on this picture, this is very hard to understand and recognize, but we actually have pancreatic tissue here, pancreatic tissue, basically the head here and part of the head there, and the duodenum is trying to squeeze in between right there. So that's what's happening. Um, that person, this is most likely a baby. Um, this is not 100% the same as our book, not a big deal. Uh, our book, first of all, did not mention nucleases, uh, which is another enzyme which handles nucleic acids, easy enough. And our book uh, does not mention carboxypeptidase. Peptidase. What did we mention? We, uh, we had, uh, I know we had trypsinogen and chemotrypsinogen, right? Yeah, trypsinogen and so trypsin, trypsinogen, same difference. Chymotrypsinogen is a different one. Carboxypeptidase, we did not mention, but all they all handle proteins. And remember the important thing, let's see, we have that. Remember the, the important thing about these guys is that they need to be in a preactive state, um, a proteolytic state. Otherwise, if they become Proto, uh, 
pre-proteolytic. Protolytic, in other words, active, they're not going to stop. They're going to eat, eat their way right out of the organ. Um, hormones, insulin from the beta cells, glucose to glycogen, glucagon in the alpha cells, glycogen, glycogen to glucose and somatostatin from the delta cells, those are alpha and beta inhibitors. Laboratory tests, uh, amylase, um, lipase. Glucose, we didn't mention. Uh, this is literally, you, you drink some glucose and the test, uh, and, and then minutes later, they take blood, they see how quickly ingested glucose is cleared from the blood. All right, I think most of us are probably understanding these transverse images, transverse on the body, sagittal on, on, on this organ. Um, actually, this is a good one to look at. We have a pretty normal looking head. And then look how thin this person's neck is, neck and first part of the body. Very thin, and that happens sometimes. And then this person has uh, the end of the body and the tail uh, seem to be quite thicker. Another one, pretty normal looking. This is a pretty normal looking organ here. We have to be able to see this organ in sagittal as well. Now this person, it's got a nice long left lobe of the liver. This is sagittal, even the liver looks the same whether you're looking at it sagittal or transverse. And this is a sagittal view. So this is pointing down towards the feet. And the pancreas is not nearly as obvious. What we have here is this is kind of more or less the head of the pancreas, the anterior head of the pancreas, and then the superior mesenteric vein is coming. And the, so superior mesenteric vein and the, and the confluence is right about here. But then there's just a little bit of tissue down here. That's really hard to see, but this tissue, kind of where the arrow is ending, that's the uncinate process. So we got head, SMV, uncinate. Uh, horrible picture, but worth looking at because by visualizing landmark, we recognize we recognize we could find the proverbial needle in the haystack. This is IVC portal vein. It's circular here because it's pretty much coming right at us. It started up over here and it's coming pretty much directly towards us in this perspective. We're sagittal here. Normally, we would never be able to say that's pancreas here, but since we know it, where it exists, and when we take a close look, then we realize, okay, this is pancreas. Uh, stomach, a little bit of pancreatic tissue here, another horrible picture, but we can figure things out if we know where we're at. Here we have pancreatic body, and but anterior, uh, posterior to the body is the splenic vein. So by seeing the splenic vein, seeing a little bit of tissue, we say, ah, that must be pancreas above it. Another just got off a picture. I'm like, no one missed there. Actually, all these pictures, by the way, are almost all from the other book. So you can see they haven't updated their, their pictures in 25 years. Uh, was the class wall, the stomach. I did want to talk about that, but that picture is so bad. Uh, um, pancreatic duct, you can see duct right there, gonna come all the way down, there's the, we call the common bile duct, but really all the way down there, it's probably the ampulla or vader. This duct on this person seems a little bit too big, so I'd be, I'd be concerned what's going on in the head of the pancreas on this person. Stomach, so this fluid here is inside of the stomach. 
Uh, CT, this is worthwhile looking at these CT images. Um, kind of a thin pancreas uh, here. That's it, a kind of a feather, almost feathery in, in appearance. Uh, this does not look like a happy pancreas to me, but I don't know how to read CT that well, so maybe, maybe not. That looks a little bit unhappy. Um, this pancreas, well, this is a thin person. Oh. Oh, this, this could be a problem. What's going on right here? So head is man, maybe a little funny looking, but I, I wouldn't know. Tail and then something lights up down here. And this is there's contrast. There's swallowed contrast, the stomach, and there's injected contrast. That's the aorta and SMA up here. So this is probably from injected contrast. Um, maybe maybe uh, maybe it's just do, do I know? Do I know? I don't know. I don't know. That's suspicious to me, but I don't know how to read CT. Here's a nice little feathery. Wasn't there a pathology where um, that thing would just be down at the, well, no, that was in the gallbladder and the biliary tree where it was just down at the tail end. It ended in seal. I can't remember what it, exactly what it was called. Like colon um, the seal or something like that. Oh, colidocal seal. Um, yeah, that, that actually goes in the duodenum. Um, I don't know. This is, uh, I would actually, one thing that came to mind was a pseudocyst, but then a pseudocyst would not light up because there's no way for contrast to get into it. So uh, perhaps a tumor, perhaps nothing. I don't know how to read these. So um, pathology. Acute or chronic pancreatitis, uh, pancreas becomes damaged and malfunctions as a result of increased secretion, increased secretion or blockage of ducts. When this occurs, pancreatic tissue may be digested by its own enzymes. Um, obviously, uh, we don't think this patient's alive anymore uh, because we got the right lobe and left lobe of the liver here, and um, this would be a hemorrhagic. Yeah, hemorrhagic pancreatitis because this is coagulated blood. It's hemorrhagic because the the enzymes not only ate the tissue but ate the ate right through the vessels, and so it obviously is going to bleed when, you, when you're eating the vessel walls. Hmm. I never understood this picture. I always kept it because it looked like a some kind of fat alien waving at us. But. Yeah, diffusely enlarged uh, pancreas here. Oh, this is interesting. Um, almost stripy on this. So this pancreas tissue here, and there's like hypo hypoechoic stripes. That's like that's fluid. That's free fluid inside the pancreas, so probably enzymes. Uh, and there's a little bit of free fluid outside the pancreas. So this, and this is this is also a little bit stripy and thickened as well. So fluid has has made its way outside the pancreas on this patient. Um, I believe uh, this book slightly disagreed with the most common sites for fluid collection. Uh, the lesser sac, I think. I think your book said actually more like in the tail, um, which would be kind of anterior perirenal spaces because the tail not only ends at the uh, hilum of the spleen, but the, the kidney is at the hilum of the spleen. So uh, that would be, uh, uh, according to our book, probably the number one area and then lesser sac. Uh, fluid collections may result spontaneous, but those that do not are recognized as pseudocysts. Pseudocysts are, are acquired. They result from trauma to the gland. 
that can develop in 10 to 20% of patients with acute pancreatitis, and they develop over 46 weeks. So the fluid exiting the pancreas happens immediately or practically immediately, but the pseudocyst development takes time, and that's because it has to, the body is walling it off and creating like a fibrous shell around it. That's what the pseudocyst actually is. I thought about mentioning this yesterday, I wasn't sure. A sterile abscess, because you pretty much you always learn that abscesses are, are anything but stale, sterile. The whole reason we have abscesses uh, is for bacterial infection in a closed, wet environment. And so uh, the bacteria is able to grow and, and um, you know, destroy tissue, create pus, and, and make an abscess. But a sterile abscess is all the inflammatory reaction without the bacteria. So the, pan the pancreatic pseudocyst may develop a sterile abscess. Uh, body walls off the irritating fluid. Here's a nice picture of a pseudocyst. You can see, you can't clearly see a nice defined wall on this because it doesn't have a defined wall. And that's at the head of the pancreas. Uh, pancreatic pseudocyst with septation and, and, and junk along the walls, and that's at more towards the head. Transverse image, that's IDC down here. Yeah. Um, and then this is a nice big pseudocyst at the tail, and we see left kidney down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the book, so the other book did, did say that the um, the most common location of a pseudocyst is the lesser sac, anterior to the pancreas and posterior to the stomach. Well, that's where the that's where the lesser sac is. Um, your book said the tail. Well, pararenal space is basically the tail. And this is a stupid statement. Fluid occurs more commonly in the left pararenal space than in the right. Well, no kidding, that's where the tail is. Um, fluid collection on the right, near the right kidney would be difficult for it to travel that far. So we've, we've mentioned, like, this is the epiglottic, epi, ec, epiglottic foramen or the foramen of Winslow. This is the only um, communication between the greater sac, which is basically what we're seeing here, and the lesser sac, which is kind of through this little cave behind all of this. Um, and so a pseudocyst in the lesser sac can, or the fluid can find its way through the foramen of Winslow and get into the peritoneal space as well. I mentioned, oh, let's talk about this. Now, our book didn't mention this at all. This would be this would be pretty horribly painful, even more painful than a regular. But if um a, a pseudocyst or or the the enzymes could actually make its way through the diaphragm and into the mediastinum. The mediastinum is simply this space which contains the heart the thymus, the, uh, the esophagus, trachea, all of that is in the middle, is in mediastinum, whereas the, the right and left pleura are where the lungs are. So th this is, has its own space, and that would be pretty, pretty horrible. And the way it would go get up here is probably, it would follow along the, um, uh, along the, uh, the, the, the esophagus, um, or next to the esophagus and kind of squeeze through. Some more pseudocysts. Spontaneous rupture is rare, but uh, did, did it say somewhere right here? Rare, but uh, very deadly. Massive pseudocysts, transesophageal ulcers, unguided drain. 
I'm just visualizing Jeff as before. Yeah, that's weird. So they have, um, uh, so they have a transesophageal ultrasound. They stuck, they stuck a special transducer down the neck, down the uh, esophagus. So they get a nice close look at this large, I don't know if this is the same person, but a large pseudocyst and they're gonna to try to drain it. It's stuck a needle in here. I'm not 100% sure why they have color here other than seeing, you know, trying to visualize leaking fluid, but. Oh, there it is. Yeah, mortality rate 50% for a ruptured pseudocyst. It's certainly a large one like this. Hemorrhagic, we already mentioned, is just simply um, um, uh, necrotizing. Well, it's necrotizing because of the enzymes, but then it bleeds because the enzymes are also eating the vascular structure. Uh, very echogenic pancreas here. Hard to recognize it's so echogenic. Uh, there's our Fledgeman picture again. Uh, actually, let's go back. Fledgeman is an inflammatory process. It spreads along fascia pathways, causing localized areas of diffuse inflammatory edema. Chronic pancreatitis from recurrent attacks of acute pancreatitis. Um, I knew this one girl. <sighs> she was weird. Um, she had, she legitimately had chronic pancreatitis. Um, you can't fake that because you know, your labs, <laughs> you know, and imaging is gonna show whether or not you have it. So she, she wasn't faking that. She definitely had chronic pancreatitis, but she definitely really hung her identity on having pancreatitis. And then um, I, was, I worked with her, she wasn't a sonographer, she was, a, she was an EMT actually. Um, and then I'm at a bar one day and I see her coming in a wheelchair. I said, what's going on? And she says, oh, I'm paralyzed now. And it was interesting because I didn't believe her for a second that she was paralyzed because she, she hung her identity so much on having pancreatitis that when she had the opportunity, and she did, I'm sure, have a back injury on the job, but I just felt like, no, I don't think she has pancreatitis. Well, then I find out that a friend of mine who was a, uh, who runs a, um, uh, a, a rehab hospital had her as a patient. And I, uh, and I says, Oh, how's your, uh, was it Munchausen? I forgot the, I forgot the, I think it's Munchausen, right? When you pretty much just pretend, or, or make yourself believe you have something wrong. I said, how's, my, how's your Munchausen patient? He knew exactly what I was talking about. So. Um, anyway, uh, pay a, a, just a stupid sideshow of a, of a story. But um, uh, part, chronic pancreatitis, pseudocyst, dilated common bile duct. Well, that's because that might be what caught, well, dilated common bile duct and dilated um, pancreatic duct due to a stone or mass or whatever is uh, that all goes together. Uh, thrombosis is a splenic vein. Well, yeah, because of the enzymes making their way, damaging the vein and causing thrombosis, uh, and, and increased risk of patient developing pancreatic cancer. We mentioned that already. Um, I don't even know why we include these pictures because I can't understand what I'm looking at. Uh, just, just a nice picture of chronic pancreas. Not a nice picture, but at least shows um, echogenicity is increased, especially in some areas. That can be either calcium or fat infiltration, fat necrosis. Let's see, calcifications. Yeah, so they're saying calcifications. I don't know. I don't see any shadowing, but. Um, ooh, massively dilated uh, pancreatic duct on this person. And, calcification slash, slash fat slash tumor or whatever over here. Um, 
cystic lesions. I was going to say that's the biggest gastroduodenal artery I've ever seen, but I guess it's a cyst. Autosomal dominant polycystic uh, kidney disease can cause some cysts on the uh, pancreas, not a ton. You could have just simple congenital cysts. You could have cystic fibrosis. Uh, um, cystic fib I'm sorry. I'm, I'm afraid to scratch this out because it'll be there for the rest of the day, but uh, uh, a cystic fibrosis doesn't cause cysts. I'm sorry. <sighs> Maybe. I've never heard of that. Um, anyway, uh, um, uh, fibrocystic disease of pancreas, congenital malformation of pancreas. Yeah. Uh, von Hippel Lindau, um, that is a well, cystic disease or tumor disease of kidneys, pancreas, general tract, actually a lot more than that. Um, brain, uh, lungs, I think, even. That's a nice little simple looking cyst there. Adenocarcinoma, we already mentioned that that was the, that's the big one, more than 90% of all malignant pancreatic tumors and unfortunately very deadly. Carcinoma of the pancreas, rare before the age of 40, but after that, look out. Uh, prognosis is poor with a median survival time of two to three months and a one year of only 8%. Okay, so this book was even probably even a little bit worse than the other book as far as prognosis. Um, like I said the other day, tumors in the pancreatic head present symptoms early. So that's the good thing about having a head tumor because it causes obstruction of the common bile duct, with jaundice and high drops, uh, high drops of the gallbladder. So jaundice and high drops of the gallbladder, remember, oh, it's right there. Corbassier says that you have high drops without right upper quadrant pain. And um, the, uh, the unfortunate thing is that it almost all, all, it oftentimes means you have pancreatic carcinoma. Um, tumors in the body and tail are less specific, of course, because they can grow to a very large size before you know anything is wrong. Well, yeah, see, there you go. Um, once again, oh. Carcinoma of the body of the pancreas, tumor has metastasized to the liver, yeah. So this pancreas, I mean, I don't, I'm not really that familiar with gross pathology, but and that really looks nasty with a little bit of spleen still attached to this uh, specimen. There's liver with metastasis all over it. And uh, this is duodenum right there. Uh, yep, hypochoic tumor here. Let's see, what am I looking at exactly? Hey, what up? Uh, oh yeah, so this is the the splenic duct, um, pancreatic duct, huge. Yeah, we saw that one already. Um, so this tumor is back here. Let's see, the tail, tail of pancreas. Yeah, tumor here with appears to be a cystic portion. I don't really know how to explain that, so I won't. Um, serous cisadenomas cis and mucinous cisadenoma or cisadenocarcinoma. So the, um, this is the one that's not so bad to have. And the mucinous cisadenoma. I think your book says that these were all cancer, and I, I didn't think so. And, and, and but they, they can become cancerous, the cystadenocarcinoma, and those um, are a little bit worse, but not as bad as the um, adenocarcinoma. Count for less than 10 to 15 million pancreatic, less than 1% of the pancreatic malignancies. Um, multiple tiny cysts. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, gosh. That reminds me, I want to go grab some. Uh, what's that fruit where you eat the seed? Hmm. Yeah. 
uh, it's the same in the head of pancreas, not causing obstruction of pancreatic duct, large mass in the head of pancreas, it's compressing it. Okay, so I was, this is an endoscopic ultrasound. So um, we're right up against the mass, which is why this is a very weird picture. Other than saying that this is most likely the mass, I don't know what I'm looking at. One of the great vessels here. I don't get it. Uh, let's see, macrocystic adenoma. Um, yeah, and so the macrocystic adenoma, the mucinous cisadenocarcinomas, these are uh, have a malignant potential, um, and these are larger cysts. And that's exactly what it is also in, in gynecology as well, is the mucinous cisadenocarcinomas are larger um, and also you know, there are more malignant potential, potential as well. Um, yeah, we didn't even, we're not gonna talk about that tumor. If there's a tumor in the head of the pancreas and both the pancreatic duct and CBD may be ectatic, and there's a beautiful word there, ectasia. So CBD, oh, this is a better one, CBD, coming across, mass, and then here's pancreatic duct as well. Mass here, pancreatic duct. Endocrine, um, oh yeah, we, we did talk about from the islet cells of Langerhans, the endocrine uh, tumors. Um, insulinomas, so some note. Pain is a ten-year-old, <laughs> ten year old dog. They look a lot like us. <laughs> so this is actually a dog. Um, sometimes when I'm looking on the internet, I find veterinary um, ultrasound easier to find. Sometimes. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on all these little tumors, gastronomas. Um, metastatic disease to the pancreas, according to this book, um, melanomas, breast, gastrointestinal, and lung. And I think we did say that melanomas, oh, my little dot's gone. Anyway, um, melanomas um, are the number one parapancreatic. So parapancreatic neoplasms, uh, we didn't really cover that. And I don't know why we would. A lymphoma is a malignant neoplasm of, of lymph and most frequently um, you'd see hypocodinism. Well, what we're going to see is it's called lymph adenopathy in this case. Uh, not, not, not that lymphoma can't, can't metastasize directly to the pancreas or the liver or the spleen itself, but um, like what they're really describing here is lymph adenopathy, um, lymph nodes in the area of the pancreas increasing in size. Ah, yes, uh, multiple nodes are seen on the pancreas. So... This node here, um, honestly, I would have called it inside the pancreas because this is all pancreatic tissue around it. So, but if they're saying it's, well, well, yeah. And so this could be a lymph node that happens to be, that happens to look like it's inside of the pancreas. Over here, we have lymph nodes. But... Um, or it's actually lymphoma in the body of the pancreas causing a tumor. So I don't, I'm not 100% sure with this one what, which, which we're looking at. Oh, this, look at this. This is a great, there's a lymph node down here, kind of underneath, uh, probably along the spine and pushing up on the aorta a little bit, or at least impinging on the aorta here. And then... There's too many lumps and bumps here. Some of these have got to be lymph nodes. Uh, 
Yeah, we're not gonna. Um, we did mention, I don't know, we get to lymphangiomas with the spleen as well, I think. So lymphangiomas are, are um, a malformed lymph structure tumors. And they can be seen in not just, you know, uh, in, the, in the pancreas, but they can be seen in the spleen, they can be seen um, on the skin, they can, they can be seen all over the body. And some people have a lot of these um, with certain syndromes. Uh, cystic, cystic teratomas. Uh, okay, cool. All right. Whoops, I don't want to end the... Actually, no, I want to end recording. We'll, we'll do a completely new recording.